Please take your Bibles, turning with me to Hebrews chapter 10, and I begin reading with verse 26 down to the end of the chapter. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Once again, verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great Reward. Numerous times through the past 2,000 years, the Christian church has formulated what is sometimes called a statement of faith or a confession or a creed. And these are summaries, they are a synopsis of Bible doctrine that is put into sometimes a portion, a passage, which can be easily memorized and which covers sort of the gamut of doctrine. It covers a wide swath of the Word of God. And it reminds us of those things which are especially vital points. Usually these creeds or confessions, they stem from a point of conflict, a point where there was no clarity on a particular doctrine or on a particular matter. And so they differ one from another, but they each serve a vital purpose. As we come to the second half of Hebrews chapter 10, and as we continue to consider how that we are to press in, we are to draw near to Christ, we are to let us, we are to do these things, even as we considered last week. Here we have essentially a confession. It is a statement of the convictions which we hold. Now, even as I mentioned, each confession or creed stems from a particular problem. This confession roots itself in what these first readers we're possibly going to do to pull back, to draw away from Christ. And so, the word here is don't do that. Press farther in. There are 50 or 100, should we mine 
every last one of them, there are 50 or 100 points that we could draw out of this passage, but I would want to leave with you 12 where we are told about the confidence that we have in Christ and the confidence of what the Bible teaches us. Let's touch on some of these right now. First of all, confidence number one. We are told here that there is nothing more important for us than our spiritual state. Jesus put it in slightly different terms in Matthew chapter 16. You will recall that Jesus asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? They gave various responses, but Peter, when Jesus pushed them harder, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And as a result, for that confession, Jesus pronounced a blessing upon Peter. But then Jesus would go on and he would speak to them about the cost of discipleship. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then he also said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? The whole world. He didn't say just a portion of it. You recall that one temptation that the de devil brought before Jesus in the wilderness, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he says, I'll give it to you if you simply fall down and worship me. All the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus, here he says, if we get it all, if we are the president of every country, if we are the king of every empire, if we are the prime minister of every nation, if we have all the dollars of all the banks, but yet, but yet, if we lose our soul, if we forfeit our soul, what will a man gain, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's a fool's bargain if we focus upon the things of this world only and we leave our souls beggared and impoverished if we never give thought to the things of eternity. We are indeed of all fools most foolish. First of all, nothing is more important than the Spirit. If we go on our way and we sin and we give no thought to it after having received the truth, we are told that there is a terrifying expectation of judgment indeed. Just a few sermons ago, back in Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 4, 5, and 6, you may remember that there was again a very stern word, and some commentators place it as the most severe language in the whole Bible. Here in chapter 10, we are once again taken by the shoulders and shaken, and we, who might be a little bit drowsy in our spirit, we are slapped and we are told, will you realize the danger of your soul if you just write it off, if you put it off for a more convenient time? It is a perilous situation to find yourself in if you become careless and callous as to the true condition of your soul. Nothing is more important than the spiritual state of your soul. And though discipleship is costly, it is worth it all. Second confidence that we together share, second confidence is that judgment will come. We are told, and we have considered already, 
that it is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. Judgment will come for each and every one. And the third confidence that we have is that God is the judge. That we are not judged based upon the standards or the criteria of this world. We are not judged based upon our towing the line of political correctness for what is politically correct. What is politically correct in one country is not the same as it is in another country. And what is politically correct today was not politically correct 25 years ago. Public opinion changes and the whims and the attitudes of people. It is God who is the one with whom we have to do. And so we come before His Word and we look and we dig in to find what is pleasing before Him, regardless of whether this world cares about it or not. Confidence number four is that mercy has been extended. Mercy has been extended. At the end of verse 29, we are reminded of the spirit of grace and what a horrible thing it is to insult, that is to belittle, to treat as an insignificant thing, the grace that we have received. It is God's grace and we must not consider what He has done on our behalf to be insignificant or to be just, well, I'll get to that when I'm in my, in my time, when I find a convenient opportunity. Today is the day of salvation, and this is vital. Mercy has been extended. Confidence number five, hardship. Hardship should not be a surprise for the believer in Christ. If it is a surprise, then surely it tells us that we are poor students both of the Bible and of church Christian history. It tells us that we are not paying attention. For even in the Old Testament, how holy men and women, as we will see when we consider Hebrews chapter 11, many of them lived triumphant lives, but who of them did not have periods where they were sorely tried? and horribly tested. Our confidence is that indeed hardship is not to be thought of as something strange for the believer in Christ. Con con uh, confidence number six. The things of this world are fading. Fading. We are told that in verse 34, that we are looking forward to a better possession and a lasting one. Better possession and a lasting one. The things of this world, we call them temporal, for they are temporary. Those things that we pursue after, those things that we clamor for, those things that we dream about getting, they are so temporary. But Christ, He has come in order that the temporary might be done away with and that we who have known heretofore only the temporary might know the permanent, the real thing, the real article. We are not to be surprised by struggle. And we look for that which He has promised, better possession and lasting one. Of course, He's speaking of heaven. He's speaking of that place which He has gone to prepare where the gold and the silver will never canker or rust and where things don't break down. Confidence number seven, verse, verse 35, 
as I read a couple of times, we are not to throw away our confidence because it has great reward. Now, if it simply said it has reward, we should rightly sit up and pay attention. But it says it has great, great reward. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we are told, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, those who draw near. The very character of our God is that he is not parsimonious. He is not trifling. He does not spoon it out just in little tiny packages. But he is a great rewarder of those who seek and those who delight in him. Our confidence is that this is our God and that all that he has done for us is only a foretaste of what he will yet do and the delights which we have yet to enter into. Our confidence is, number eight, that we are called to endure. Verse 36 says, you have need of endurance. You have need of endurance. Sir Ernest Shackleton named his ship more than a hundred years ago, Endurance, and they set that toward the South Pole, hoping to cross over from one side to the other. But endurance was caught by the ship and it was crushed. And the men were left to fend for themselves. And surely only by the mercy of God, every last one of them made it back out of that horrific ordeal. Will we, in the struggles that we face, we are also called to endure, to not pack it in, to not give up, but to continue to press forward. For, when, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. And that brings us to our next confidence. We are called to do God's will. We are called to do it. As we have made our way through this series, we have concluded each Sunday with the same benediction taken from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And verse 21 says that God is going to equip us in every good thing to do his will. That is of foremost concern for the believer in Christ. Even as Jesus came to do the Father's will, we who have taken up our cross and are following after Jesus, we are to do the will of God. Number 10, confidence number 10, Christ is coming. Verse 37 says, for yet in a very little while he who is coming will come and will not delay. Now consider that this was written to people somewhere in the middle decades of the first century. They were ready to pack it in on Christ because that coming that they had heard about it hadn't happened yet. Where is he? And they are reminded in a little while. Now some would strain at that. And they said now another 1950 years have come and gone. And he still hasn't come. But the word is still perfectly true. The promise is perfectly solid that has been given to us. Yet, in a very little while. That's taking heaven's perspective. 
when you step out of time and you look at this world from boundless eternity, eternity past and eternity to come, it'll seem like just a very little tiny bit of time that we live on this world and that we waited for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet in a very, in a very little while, just as it says, great reward, pay attention to those additional words of description. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming, he is going to make his appearance and will not delay. This is our glad confidence that Christ, having gone, even as he said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. He gave us of the Spirit which he promised, and he will come, having finished all of the preparations in glory for us to abide there for all eternity. Christ is, is coming. Confidence number 11. And this is a, is a teaser. This is a lead-in to what we will consider next week in Hebrews chapter 11. The great hall of faith where we are told how that these men and women lived by faith. By faith. By faith it is driven home to us. Here we are reminded that the just is to live by faith, verse 38 of Hebrews 10. But my righteous one shall live, truly live, not just exist, but live by faith. This is how we are to move forward. And confidence number 12, we shall win the fight. We shall win the fight. Here this writer, he is writing to some who are in grave danger of pulling back, of pulling away, of not drawing near as they ought to. They're in peril. But here he writes with confidence, with confidence, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction. Why? Oh, it's because these people, they were going to take hold of the counsel which was given in the middle of this chapter, where it said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. They were laying hold of that. And beyond that, lest anyone fall out of the boat, Lest anyone be lost overboard, they, they were committing themselves to consider how that they might stimulate one another to love and good deeds, and how that they might encourage one another all the more as they saw the day of Christ returning, drawing ever near. And they said, we're not going to shrink back but we're going to press in and we are going to delight ourselves in God and we are going to know more and more of His great goodness. Our confidence, our confidence is that our God has loved us with an everlasting love and that He has come and that He has died upon Calvary and that by dying upon Calvary, the old question of sin and guilt and the burden that was weighing heavy upon us has been dealt with fully and finally and that it is glory on ahead and that heaven stands open for the child of God. This is our confidence and why would we ever recoil even though struggle comes our way even though there are days which are difficult and long, even though there are nights when we might feel we're all alone, 
Our God cares for us and he watches over his own. This is our confidence in him. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your every blessing. We give you thanks that you speak through your word and you remind us so wonderfully of key points that we can hold to and things that stabilize us and lead us forward. So continue to work among us, O oh God, I pray, receiving praise, honor, glory at all times. I pray for any man or woman who hears me now and they're thinking of drawing back or perhaps they already have beat a retreat. I pray that they would come before the mercy seat and Lord, that they would implore your forgiveness. I pray that they would press in. Oh Lord, I pray that they would find once again their confidence in you, the confidence which indeed bears a great reward. This isn't something small and tiny such as the rewards of this world. This is vast beyond measure. Lord, hear us, I pray, and work among us. For those who have been growing in grace, may the growth speed all the more. And may we be strong in you, in you alone. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.